Good morning, Calvary. It's still morning, right? A little bit. Thank you so much for having us here today. We really appreciate uh, being here for first service and uh, looking forward to sharing with you here for second service. I uh, wanted to introduce my family to you. I have my wife and my son Gabriel here on the front seat, so you can wave and say hi to them. Uh, my other two are up there in the picture. Uh, Josiah is six years old. Nadia, my oldest, is 11 years old. So, And Rebecca is currently expecting the newest missionary to Cambodia. Um, and that baby is due at the end of August. So we appreciate your prayers. That baby is due very, very soon. And I appreciate just as you remember to pray for our family, please pray for Becca as uh, she's 36 weeks tomorrow. So um, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Um, in regards to us, given a little bit of introduction about kind of who we are, I was a children's pastor in Lancaster, Pennsylvania for eight years. Um, that was a, at a church called New Life. Really enjoyed being a children's pastor. That was a super fun time. Uh, my wife is a registered nurse. And, you know, our callings were a little bit different because, uh, you know, every missionary that you talk to has a different story of how they got into being a missionary. I had no plans whatsoever of being a missionary. I, I share that openly. I have no problem saying that. You know, occasionally Jesus and I still talk about it. But, you know, I loved teaching children um, the word of God. I loved preaching and teaching missions to kids. Now, my wife, on the other hand, she became a registered nurse because when she was a child, she felt God's call to be a missionary. So, I mean, I had, I had this plan, okay? You know, God, God and I, you know, we had an agreement for a while, you know, that our mission plan as our family was I would preach and teach the missions to children, and I would send Rebecca on missions trips, I loved this plan. Again, Jesus and I once in a while, you know, this conversation is a little recurring. But, you know, that was great until one Sunday morning, I was leading worship with our kids, and as soon as I looked up, we had a Cambodian family at our church, and I had their kids in my ministry. During worship, I looked up at this little Cambodian girl, and as soon as I looked at her, all the children worshiping in front of me were no longer my kids, but they were a room full of Cambodian children. And I had no idea what to do with that. I went home. I started praying. Took a long time. Took about six weeks before I told Rebecca about it. Because I was scared. I, I, I knew... I kind of knew what it was, right? When God does something like that, I, I am not one to say, oh yeah, God told me this, God spoke to me. There's a few times in my life I can say, God really spoke to me powerfully in this time, and I am not the kind of guy who's like, oh yeah, this and that, but I didn't want to really have that conversation with my wife. As soon as I did, though, I shared what, what God uh, had spoken to me. The first thing she said is, you know that's a call to the mission field, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I know. We took time, we fasted, we prayed together. God really confirmed during that time that yes, this was a missionary call. Uh, he was asking us to go, so we did. I quit my job as a kids pastor. Uh, we raised our support to do a missionary associate term. So for the past two years, uh, we've been living in Cambodia. Um, I don't expect you to know a whole lot about Cambodia, so I brought a picture to show you where it is. It's in Southeast Asia. It's next to Laos and Thailand and Vietnam, right where the star is, is Phnom Penh. And that is where our family uh, lived for two years. Uh, while we were there, we were learning language, <laughs> longest alphabet in the world. That is one of the things that Cambodia can boast. Jesus and I have conversations about that too. But that is another fun thing. We learned culture. We learned uh, building relationships with national church leaders. As I said, Becca's a nurse. She was doing medical missions trips, uh, going up river to remote provincial villages uh, with medical teams, things like that. So it was a busy two years that we were there. Um, but that was kind of a short, ex a short experience. Just two years is not a long time. Um, as far as... People coming to Cambodia, they don't do that very often. Their, their tourism sector is not super big, but when they do, they come to the one main tourist site, and I would almost argue the only tourist site in Cambodia is in the northern part of the country called Angkor Wat. It's this very ancient temple, um, currently used as a Buddhist temple. I'll show you a picture there too. 
You may have seen it in a movie and didn't even know it. Um, it's one of these places where like, you know, the giant Buddha head statues are tipped over and the roots are growing all over it and like the trees are all crooked and like these ancient temple kind of places. If you might have watched it sometime, watching a movie of sorts and didn't realize they were filming in Cambodia. But that is the place that people often come to see and that is about it um, for as far as coming to Cambodia. The other thing that people often know um, talking to people who are just a little bit older than me, is that from 1975 to 79, Cambodia was ruled by a communist regime called the Khmer Rouge. Okay? And during that time, the leader, Pol Pot, killed a third of his own people. Okay? That part of the world is now often referred to as the killing fields. You may have heard that term before. That is a reference to Cambodia for the, the genocide that took place there during the late 70s. Um, that country is still recovering uh, during that time. Next slide, I'll kind of show you what we're dealing with. Um, as far as religion goes, we're looking at a 94% Buddhist country. So primarily, we're dealing with a Buddhist population. Um, there is a small Muslim population, 3.5%, 1.5% Christian, 1% everything else. And again, these statistics are um, arbitrary isn't the right word, but you can never really be quite sure that you have accurate statistics in a, in a country that um, is a developing country, okay? Because it's just very difficult to get accurate. I, I saw these. These kind of agreed with um, what the Assemblies of God is posting as their official statistics. So this is what we're sharing. Uh, as far as Buddhism goes, I don't want to talk very long about that. Really what it comes down to, um, practicing Buddhism in Southeast Asia, the root of it is fear, if you talk to a Buddhist person, um, everything that you do in Buddhism is because you're afraid, okay? Especially you're afraid of the spiritual world, okay? You, they constantly are focused on the spirits that live there. Our neighbor, while we lived in there, uh, you know, we had a mango tree in our front yard. The, the neighbor's servant continually praised, placed offerings at the base of our mango tree in our yard to the spirit who lived in the mango tree. And I would constantly be moving the little offering back over to their side, pray over the tree in Jesus' name, and they just, just kept moving on. This, was a, this is a normal thing. Let me show you a more elaborate offering. This is an offering of food laid out to the spirits in front of a furniture store. Now, again, Cambodia is a very poor nation. This person is not poor. You may be able to tell. Okay, full, full out, you know, uh, roasted pig in the center. This is not for people. This is for spirits. And what this is, is this is an open invitation to the spirits of that region saying, please come into my home. Please come into my business. I, I'm honoring you. I want you to help me. And here's the thing. If you don't do this, those spirits become evil spirits who want to harm you because you're not honoring them. Now they believe that those evil spirits will do things like hurt their business, cause one of their children to get sick, uh, cause disunity or anger or things to flare up in their home. So they are constantly trying to appease the spiritual world around them. They are constantly trying to get powerful spirits on their side to help protect them against evil spirits who want to hurt them. Now let me tell you, there's only two spirits in this entire world. Two, there's the spirit of the one true God and there's the spirit of the enemy. And these people every single day are literally giving an open invitation to the spirit of the enemy to come into their home, to come into their family, to come into their life. The result of that is fear. The result of that is oppression. The result of that is it's a very dark place. Buddhism is not a peaceful religion. It's a very dark, oppressive religion. And it's sometimes difficult to, to be there. But let me say, as we are missionaries, being able to introduce the Cambodian people to the most powerful spirit who exists, the Holy Spirit, that's an awesome thing to be able to do. And that's something appealing to Buddhist people. The, the next slide I wanted to show you too quickly, often we share this with children, um, is that, you know, Idol worship is still very rampant around the world too. May not happen here in America. This is an idol seller in Phnom Penh that I took some photos of inside of a Buddhist temple. Again, it's the whole inviting spirits into my home. There we go. Some idols that people will bring in. 
This morning, I want to share with you from John chapter 21, okay? I want to jump right into the conversation that Jesus is having with Peter. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually jump in, though, at the very end of this conversation, often referred to as the restoration of Peter. So in John chapter 21, we'll be starting in verse 17. He, that is Jesus, said to him, Peter, the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? That's John, by the way. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So we're going to talk about following Jesus this morning. Three ways that we're going to follow Jesus. I want this to be a practical message that kind of reveals a little bit about world missions, but is also very practical for you right here in Dover, Delaware. Okay? And the first thing is this. Follow Jesus down the path that he has chosen for you. Follow Jesus down the path he has chosen for you. Now, This restoration of Peter, you may remember the last interaction that Peter had with Jesus was not a good one. He had blown it big time because he denied three times that he even knew Jesus. And this was the last interaction he had. He's calling down curses on himself, cursing, saying, I don't know the man. I've never met, I have nothing to do with him. And that was it. That's the last time that he had saw Jesus and had a conversation and an interaction with him. And now comes this conversation. Now, I do not know what was going on explicitly in the mind and heart of Peter, but I do know what it feels like to mess up. I have a feeling you do too. When you have blown it, when you have sinned against someone else, you've sinned against the Lord, and then you have to reapproach them, and you're kind of like, I don't know where this relationship stands now. I, I don't know. Maybe Peter was wondering if he had a future in ministry with Jesus. Like, maybe he thought, this is it. I, I've blown it. I'm not going to be able to be a follower, an apostle. You know, I, I have no idea. I, we don't know. But we do know what it feels like to mess up, and I bet you Peter was probably feeling that way right? And then comes Jesus, and he says, Peter, um, let me paraphrase this conversation. Peter, I still have a plan for you. I need you to follow me. I have people I need you to reach. I have things I need you to do. So let me tell you, if you feel like you have blown it, you have sinned in your life, you've messed up, um, God's plan A is to take sinful people like you, like me, forgive them and send them to go tell people about Jesus. You have not blown it so that you have no future in ministry. Just like Peter, Jesus would say, I still have a plan for you. I still have things I need you to do. Let me forgive you and follow me. Don't give up on Jesus, right? Jesus is more than capable of forgiving sin. He died on the cross to take away all sin. Don't belittle Jesus by saying you can't forgive mine. He's bigger than your sin. He can forgive and he will forgive. And then we have this thing where it's, you know, Jesus has a plan for us. Jesus has a plan for us. You know, we use this phrase a lot, okay? Follow Jesus down the plan he has for you. And then we say all the time, I was a kid's pastor, right? God has a plan for you. We would take that phrase in kids' ministry all the time. You know, you put it on a sticker, you slap the sticker on the kid's forehead, you make them feel special. And you know, there's a part of it that's really, it is special. It's amazing. The God has a plan for me. But let me tell you what we're really good at as Americans. We're really good at making plans for ourselves. 
What's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? Where, where are you going to live? What are you going to buy? Where are you going to retire? What's the, what is your career path? What are you going to do? All this, all this, all this. And then what happens when you come face to face with maybe God's plan for you is different than your plan for you. Now that doesn't sound cute like you want to slap it on a sticker anymore. Now it sounds like something hard. Because as Americans, we are often on our own plan, doing our own thing, pursuing the American dream, and then we just kind of want to invite Jesus to come along because we want him to bless us. Let me tell you, God has a plan for you. That might be different than your plan for you. It certainly was for me. What are you going to do with that? All I'm asking is that you simply open your hands to Jesus and ask him, God, what are your plans for me? I'm not telling you that you're off. That's between you and Jesus. You have to be the one to search your own heart. You have to be the one to go before the Lord and say, are you holding on to some things that you're not willing to let go of? Or are you open-handed before him and saying, God, what is your plan that you have for me? What's the plan that you have for me? And you know, for some, that might not sound like good news. Because that might mean some things have to change. But be willing to surrender your plans. Be willing to surrender yourself. And you know, we talk about freedom in Christ, but freedom in Christ is not freedom to do what we want. It's freedom from sin. It's freedom from death. It's freedom from the power of the enemy over us. But the Bible calls us, we are to be bond servants of Jesus. That means we listen to our master. It means we listen to what he says And sometimes that plan is difficult. Sometimes God gives us something hard, right? And then we say things in Christianity like, oh, God will never give you more than you can handle. Please don't ever say that ever again. Please. Okay? Being thrown into a lion's den is more than anybody can handle. Let's just be clear. Okay? We are constantly by Jesus being thrown and pushed into things that we can't handle when we're on his plan because then we're in a realm of faith where we have to rely on him. And then when good things happen, he gets the credit and not us. He always puts us outside of our ability. He always puts us outside of our comfort so that everything that we do points back to Jesus. You know, he didn't ask us to go to Cambodia because we're we're gifted or we're special. Let me tell you, there is no spiritual gift of missionary in the Bible. I looked. Not one of the spiritual gifts. Okay? Um, I do not have a spiritual gift or a natural ability to learn language. I learned that really quick. It's hard. You know, my kids are normal. You know, my kid, okay, we're, we just, we got an invitation back to a church that the last time we were itinerating, my son took out a card table in the foyer, okay, my th- then three-year-old son took out a card table. You know what was sitting on top of the card table? A five-gallon igloo water container. We flooded that foyer like a tidal wave. Okay, my kids are normal. Missionaries are normal people, just doing what God has asked them to do. We're not super spiritual. We're not, we're not heroes. Only Jesus is that. All that we're doing is saying, God, I'll trust you. I'll do what you want us to do. Just be willing to do that. Say, God, what's your plan for me? He has a plan for you. That's heavy. Don't lighten it. Have a conversation with Jesus about it. Second thing, because we have to keep talking. Follow Jesus down the path where you do not want to go. So Jesus has this conversation with Peter, right? Peter, I still have a plan for you. Peter, I need you to follow me. Uh, Peter, it's going to be hard. I'm going to lead you where you don't want to go. Did you catch that? Or did you skip over it because we're Americans? We skip over the hard parts of the Bible. It's there, I promise. It says it, we already read it. You know, it's, what what do you do? Let me read to you something from Henry Nguyen. He's a Christian author, and he says this. The world says, when you were young, you were dependent, and you could not go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you'll be able to make your own decisions and go your own way and control your own destiny. But Jesus has a different vision of maturity. It's the ability and the willingness to be led where you'd rather not go. 
Immediately after Peter has been commissioned to be the leader of his sheep, Jesus confronts him with the hard truth that the servant leader is the leader who is being led to unknown, undesirable, and painful places. The way of the Christian leader is not the way of upward mobility in which our world has invested so much, but the way of downward mobility ending on the cross. Following Jesus is not going up, it's going down. Jesus inverted things. He said, whoever wants to be the leader must be the servant of all. The least will be the greatest. The greatest will be the least. He constantly turned things on their head. Following Jesus on the path he has for you is surrendering more every day. It's laying down more of yourself, death to self, finding life in Christ, saying, God, less of me and more of you. That's hard. Because it's not about me. It's about him. Less of me, God, more of you. What do you want from me? Where, what, it's, it's saying all of those things, these dreams that I have, these plans that I have, I have to lay these down and say, Jesus, I trust you through all of this. It's a hard word. And let me tell you, um, here's the spoiler. I think some people think missionaries are really weird. I do. I can say that because I haven't always been a missionary. I kind of thought they were weird. Like they're these weird people who in their right mind would take their family, their babies, go to third world countries where people get sick and hard and it's hot. And who would do that? Right? That's not normal behavior. Okay? That's a little strange. And then God asked us to do it, and I realized (laughs) we're just normal people. And missionaries continue to be normal people. I like my comfort just as much as you do. I'm, who, what is, what's the word um, when, you, when somebody likes discomfort or somebody likes pain? What is that word? I forget it. Yes. What, we'll say it again. A masochist. That's it. A masochist enjoys pain. That's a psychological illness. Okay? Let me show you a picture. This is a picture of the Mekong River in Phnom Penh, not too far from where we lived. It runs down the center of the country. Um, It is probably like 107 degrees in this picture because the low temperature in Cambodia is like 85, okay? Now, it might feel like a bit like Cambodia today here in Delaware, but, you know, Cambodia is pretty well hot. Now, here's the Mekong. The Mekong is one of the top 10 most polluted rivers in the world. I read an article on it several months ago. Um, It's a lovely shade of brown, and it smells like a toilet. It is a toilet. That's why. Okay, let me show you another picture. This is right next to our house in central Pennsylvania where we live right now. This is the Susquehanna River. Can we go to the last one? That's the Mekong in Phnom Penh next to our house. When the wind blows just right. Mm. Next one, there's the Susquehanna. Where would you rather live? This is not a trick question. Get me. I I love the Cambodian people. There are saying things about Cambodia. I would rather live next to the Susquehanna. Am I allowed to say that and still ask for support? Like, what do you do when God asks you to do something that the initial reaction of your flesh is, yeah, I'd rather not do that? You're, you're stuck there. What, what, do you, what do you do? You have a conversation with Jesus. You have a decision to make. And let me tell you, the places where darkness is controlling, the places where Satan is ruling families, is ruling lives, they are not nice places. But how do they change? They don't change unless a Christian who loves Jesus is willing to go to one of those dark places to bring the light of Jesus there. But you know what your flesh does? Yeah, I'd rather not go there. I mean, like, you're looking at your 10-year plan, and it's like there's houses and there's fleet trees and flowers and all this. Man, this is going to be an awesome, this is a paved road to success. And then God says, that's not the path I have for you. I want you to go that path. And you look down there, and there's boulders, and there's rocks, and there's thorns, and it's really dark. You can't even see through. You hear wolves howling, and Jesus is like, yeah, that's the path for you. 
What are you going to do with that? The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. I don't care where that is. And let me tell you, the reason why there are still so many dark places in this world is because too many Christians say no. And I'm not just talking about Cambodia. What do you do when God asks you to cross the street to talk to a neighbor you don't like? What do you do when God asks you to work at a job that you really just want to get out of, but he's put you there for a purpose? What do you do when God calls to you and says, I want you to uh, serve in kids' ministry? I don't like kids. I don't care. Do what he's called you to do. He asks us to do hard things. And going and trying to fight the enemy is always something hard to do. It's not pleasant. It's not a place that you want to walk. Listen to Jesus. If he's calling you there, please do it. There's dark neighborhoods right here in Dover, I guarantee it, that you would rather not go to. Go. Start reaching people for Jesus. It's not going to be easy, but do it. It's what he's calling his church to do. I need to keep moving here because, you know, this, this, I could just spend here a long time. I'm telling you, this is not a missionary thing, okay? Did I emphasize that? This is not about being a missionary. This is about being a follower of Jesus. And our job is to run into the darkness. Greater is he who's in you than he is in the world. Okay, the fire that God puts in your heart and soul when you are filled with the Holy Spirit is stronger than the greatest forces of Satan that's out there you can run to the darkness. And that is what he asks his church to do. Not everybody is supposed to be a missionary, but you are supposed to fight the darkness. And you're supposed to find, ask him what that means for you. Ask him where that is. Who is it that you're supposed to reach? What ministry are you supposed to get a part of? What neighbor are you supposed to reach out to? Who are you supposed to find? Get around people who don't know Jesus. If you can't say, oh, everybody in my circle is a Christian, that's not good. Get yourself around people who don't know Jesus and then shine his light there. And then as you do this, let me say, um, beware about comparing yourself to others. Because here's the deal. Notice what Peter did. Jesus called him to do something hard. Said, Peter, you're not going to like it. It's it's a hard path, man. He was honest. It's going to be hard for you, Peter. Peter turns. The first thing he does, what about him? Poor John's just standing there like twiddling his thumbs. What about him? Jesus, is it going to be just as hard for for John as it is for me? I need to know. You know what Jesus said? Mind your stinking business. Follow me. Let me tell you, the only way this works is if you keep your eyes on Jesus only. You start looking to the left and to the right, Satan's got you. You're going to fall, you're going to trip, you're going to stumble, you're going to give up. That's what he's trying to do. We do this all the time. We start stepping out in faith. We start doing something hard. And then Satan comes against us. He starts throwing things at us. He starts throwing sickness and discouragement or fear or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden we're like, "Ah," and we start comparing ourselves with other people going, God, why is it so easy for them? And it's so hard for me. Why are they doing so well and I am struggling so badly? Why, they're buying another house? I don't even have one, right? We get on Facebook, we start scrolling, and we're like, oh man, they're going to Hawaii again. They were just in Hawaii. How are they going back? They did, I thought COVID-19 was there too. How'd they do that, you know? Uh, they're having their 12th grandchild. I just got this stupid, stinky cat. God, it's not fair. What's wrong? It only works if you follow Jesus. Because Jesus' answer is, don't worry about them. You follow me. He'll come through. He'll be there. I promise you. But you have to keep your eyes on Jesus. It doesn't work any other way. 
Let's do the last point because I'm going too long. Follow Jesus because he loves you. Follow Jesus because he loves you. The entire conversation, if you didn't pick up on the context of the conversation that Jesus was having with Peter, he asked Peter the same question three times. Peter, do you love me? Everything Jesus asks us to do is based out of the love relationship we have with him. Everything. It's the only way it works. It's the only thing strong enough to hold us to following him. He loves us. He is going to be there for us. He is going to take care of us. Let me, can I share a couple of verses with you real quick? Up here in John chapter 14. Here's what it says in John chapter 14. Can we put it up? This is Jesus talking. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we, the Trinity, plural, we will come to them and make our home with them. When we follow Jesus out of this love relationship, he promises to show up, and he does. I can tell you, after living in Cambodia for two years, sometimes my body was very uncomfortable. Sometimes I was very frustrated. But, you know, I could lay my head on my pillow at night and know that my soul was doing what God asked me to do. Are you willing to be uncomfortable out of your love for Jesus for a little while to do what he's calling you to do? This is a blip, remember? The Bible kind of talks about how, you know, humans are but a breath, and, and then there's this whole concept of eternity. Are you willing to be uncomfortable for a little while here to enjoy God's perfect peace for eternity? Because doing hard things for Jesus is hard here. You know how Peter died? Peter followed Jesus to the end, was captured by the Romans, and sentenced to crucifixion, just like Jesus. But Peter felt that his life wasn't worthy to die the same way that Jesus did, so he requested the Romans to please crucify him hanging upside down, and they granted his request, and that's how he died. No one would choose that end. But I guarantee you, when Peter opened up his eyes, and there is Jesus standing on the other side of Calvary there saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. There is nothing in Peter that regretted going to the cross. Be willing to do hard things to enjoy God's perfect comfort for all of eternity. And following Jesus is not safe. The safest place is in the center of God's will, and he's going to take care of you until it's your time to go. But you need to stay underneath that, that hand of God that he has for you, that plan, that path that he has for you. But dying on a cross, hanging upside down, is not, it's, it's not a safe thing to do. We need to be willing to say, Jesus, you above me, above all things, when you get to a place where you find that true life and true joy and true satisfaction isn't found in what you do, but it's found in being in that love relationship with Jesus. What you do is peripheral. Being with Jesus in that relationship is the core. That's what it's all about. The good things of life want to keep us in this bubble, and then God asks us to do something hard are you willing to lay that bubble down and say, God, I want you more than these things. I want you more than this comfort. The, the bad things of Cambodia won't keep us away. The good things of America, so to speak, won't keep us here. It's not about those things. It's about following Jesus on the path that he has for us. He's the only reason we exist. He's the only reason worth existing for. And he loves you. And he's going to come through. And I need to stop talking. I'm telling you he's enough. Let me share this very last slide with you. I'm sorry, I went a little bit longer this service, but come with us. Here's what you could do. 
We are raising a budget. If you feel led to give, please talk to Pastor Ryan about the best way to do that. Um, we're currently at 85% of our budget, so we're getting close to the very end. We need some more monthly supporters uh, to bring us on to be able to get us to that 100% mark. Uh, please pray for us, okay? I showed you the little video about Gaip. That's the province we're going back to. When we go back, we are going to be trying to start a church plant in a province that has never been reached, where Christians have never gone, where the church has never been planted. That's going to be a dark place, okay? We want to get a church started there, and we need you to take our prayer card so that you pray for us, because Satan is not going to be happy that we're going there. Okay, take our prayer card, stick it up on your bathroom mirror, and then when you brush your teeth in the morning, just pray for my family, okay? And if you don't brush your teeth, just stick it on your fridge. <laughs> I know you will pray for me every single day. I got lots of prayer cards. Please, please, please come take one. You can also sign up at our table here to get our newsletter so you can keep up on how to pray for us. Um, if you'd rather, you can go onto that website on the top and there is a link on there to sign up for the newsletter. You can directly go into that and just put yourself onto our newsletter list so that you can keep up with us and pray for us. We really, really covet your prayers. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Ryan, for allowing us to come and to be here. This has been an awesome church. You, you people are very, very friendly, and uh, it's been a really joy to be here. We'd love to talk with you. We'll be here at the, at the table afterwards. Cool. Blessing.